Um, it is striking, and a lot of people I talk to um, seem to notice that. They see that um, with the war in the Ukraine, the so-called West was very keen on denouncing any breach of international law. They were even uh, putting an indictment uh, against President Putin before the, the, the criminal court in uh, Den Haag. And now, um, if there are other possible crimes, one can say, against civilian populations, the, um, the West uh, and the American and the, also the European authorities, they don't say nothing. Uh, do you see, I mean, it, it's obvious that they have uh, double standards here. How dangerous is that? I mean, I, I was just thinking, I mean, the international law, which is some kind of benchmark or hallmark, of something, an ideal we should strive to preserve, but with these double standards in the eyes of many, many people, millions of people on the, on, on the planet, what's happening with international law right now? You know, the United States made a, a good start, uh, a brilliant start in 1945, championing uh, the formation of the United Nations uh, to pick up the uh, remnants of the League of Nations, uh, which had, had not joined in the previous generation, and the United States uh, in the very person of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady uh, of the United States, uh, uh, wife of Franklin Roosevelt, our greatest president, the one who brought the United Nations, oversaw the uh, the, the formation and the, uh, and, and the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. But the United States uh, took a fateful turn in 1947 with the National Security Act, uh, which established the CIA and which put the U.S. Uh, on a path of uh, uh, secret wars, covert operations, uh, a security state, uh, and without rehashing all of uh, the, the Cold War uh, let me just summarize. Uh, the U.S. led 64 covert regime change operations between 1947 and 1989. That means usually the CIA in the lead overthrowing foreign governments, right and left. Uh, international law has never played much of a role for the United States since 1947. Uh, and my whole life, I born in 1954, uh, the United States has been overthrowing governments uh, right and left, by the way, and I, since I'm an international uh, specialist, I've seen a lot of this close up. The idea that the U.S. abides by international law is, uh, of course, uh, silly. It's uh, not even a school child should uh, have that idea. When the United States gets its way at the U.N., uh, it says, okay, uh, good. When the U.S. doesn't get its way at the U.N., it says, okay, who cares? Uh, and uh, this is uh, basically the prerogative of one country in the world, you know, the only country that has 800 military bases around the world uh, in uh, 80 countries. So, no, the U.S. does not take seriously international law, uh, has not since 1947, and it's a shame. It's a little bit like... Uh, uh, Rome keeping the trappings of the Republic, but uh, slipping into empire. Well, the United States in 1947 uh, slipped into empire. We still have the trappings of Congress and so forth. We even have the trappings of a president, because you shouldn't take too seriously what the president does. They're not in charge necessarily either on these issues. We have a permanent war machine always revving. We have CIA all over Ukraine. Come on. This is, uh, this is the real world, not the rhetoric of uh, international law, which is left to the other 192 countries of the UN, many of which would really like international law, by the way. They don't have the power of the United States. So they say better to live under law than just under uh, whatever the United States uh, deems uh, it, it, uh, it are the rules uh, of the day. So the short answer is hypocrisy is not an exception. It, it is the rule, uh, but it's the rule, it's the prerogative of the most powerful in their mind. This is why it so much comes down to arrogance repeatedly. And uh, the basis of arrogance is to, to forget the most fundamental 
adage of life, and that uh, what what uh, goes around comes around. You know, if if you behave this way, well, times are going to change, and you're going to suffer the consequences. Uh, we we once had uh, uh, somebody uh, named Jesus uh, who said that the most important law of all was uh, do to others what you would have them do to you. Uh, it, 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 Confucius said the same thing. In other words, there should be a principle that applies to everybody. That's the basic idea. Immanuel Kant said the same thing uh, at the end of uh, the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And the United States ha has been so arrogant for so long it doesn't believe it. And then countries like Israel, which have very also particular histories, and one should never underestimate what the Holocaust has meant for shaping the, the, the mindset and, and uh, understanding of the world uh, among uh, Israeli leaders. Uh, Israel is believed. We have the U.S. at our back, and so international law, hmm, not so much. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the tragic reality because we really need international law in an international world if we're not going to be at war all the time. We see growing anger in the Islamic world, in the in the Muslim world. We have seen this uh, speech by um, Turkish President Erdogan, which is that was very confrontative, was very aggressive. You see other voices. You see growing, uh, yeah, growing, um, growing anger. Do you think that um, this whole war and the way how Israel wages this war? could turn this uh, whole thing into a uh, worldwide mess in some kind of global confrontation, even into a third world war? Again, we should never underestimate how one damn thing can lead to the next. And that's why crises need to be solved, not just uh, smirked at. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, gunshots by some kids in Sarajevo in uh, 1914 set off World War I, which we're not out of yet because we're still living with the consequences of that war exactly in Israel and Palestine, by the way. And that was one damn thing leading to the next, leading to the next, to mobilization, to threats, to this and that, and, and, and suddenly war in August uh, 1914. And we're on the verge of that right now. The arrogance uh, of uh, Israel in this, uh, or rage or desperation, or however you want to characterize the emotions of it, the uh, complete failure of uh, Europe to have a coherent thought in its head, I must say, uh, mm -hmm. on this. You know, Europe all abstaining from a UN Security Council, uh, a UN General Assembly resolution calling for, for what? For a humanitarian ceasefire. Europe can't even figure that out anymore, is how bad things are in Europe. Of course, I'm exaggerating a tiny bit because France and, and Spain uh, voted uh, in favor of the humanitarian ceasefire, but most of the European Union. Yeah. Too. yeah. Oh, did. I, I didn't realize that. That's good. But what, what's it? Europe cannot figure out dozens of countries to have a humanitarian ceasefire. It's unbelievable. The United States, I understand. You know, I don't like, I don't agree with, I don't approve, but at least I understand. Europe, I don't understand how it cannot find a coherent idea, whether it's about Ukraine or whether it's about uh, Palestine uh, and Israel, because the Europe sold its foreign policy soul to the United States, for heaven's sake. Uh, it, it, there's no thought in Europe uh, about uh, normalcy right now, about diplomacy. And this is really a, a, a terrible problem. So the answer is yes. Things can easily get out of hand because we already have shelling coming from Yemen. Okay, maybe Hezbollah, maybe the United States, uh, some troops will be hit. Then the United States will... Uh, go uh, bomb by uh, Iranians uh, someplace, and then the war will escalate. And I cannot, I, I cannot stress to you enough how stupid some of American politicians are. If you want names, start with Lindsey Graham, uh, who immediately called for a war with Iran. These people just 
absolutely want to egg us on to self-destruction because to know them is to understand is not a coherent, rational idea in their heads. Mm. In this week's uh, Weltwoche edition, we have the privilege to publish your uh, most recent piece on this conflict. The English title is, um, if I get it correctly here, I got the German translation, um, Turning Carnage into Peace. Yes. This is a very concrete, a very specific path you are depicting here, you're showing here uh, from this uh, carnage, as you say, to peace. Could you um, give us the, 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 the landmarks, the, the most, the milestones of the path to peace now in this uh, difficult situation? Thank you. Uh, thanks for publishing it also. Well, it starts uh, really with von Clausewitz, uh, the uh, German war theorist uh, after Napoleon, who made the most perceptive observation about war of modern times, which is that war is the continuation of politics with other means. When you see a war, think politics. In other words, what is the underlying political driver of this violence and then address it. And the underlying uh, driver of this violence is the uh, need to implement a Palestinian state as a member of the United Nations and with control over the Islamic holy sites of East Jerusalem and with the capital in East Jerusalem. Now, that's not some great insight. That is the content of UN resolution after resolution for decades. And the UN General Assembly resolution that just passed uh, with a vote of 140 yes to 14 against said the same thing, a two-state solution. So Netanyahu blocks this. He, he's got to go anyway because of the disaster that he oversaw. But an Israeli government needs to recognize there is no peace, there is no way out of this, there is no security, there is no solution without a two-state solution. And the rest of the world needs to be very clear that this is the only way it's been on the books as international law for decades. The United States has reiterated its commitment to this, make this the centerpiece of peace right now. So the first thing I call for is the Israeli government, presumably led by a new prime minister, which could happen within the next five minutes in, in the right way, uh, to say we are ready for a political settlement based on uh, UN resolutions, both in the Security Council and in the General Assembly. And on that basis, the Arab League uh, and, in fact, the, the world's nations and the UN Security Council commit to Israel's comprehensive security and to the disarmament and uh, demobilization of these uh, military jihadist groups, uh, starting with Hamas uh, and uh, uh, also uh, the Islamic uh, Jihad and others. Now, those groups are backed uh, by Iran, among other countries. Uh, I deal a lot with Iranian diplomats. Iran is ready for normal diplomatic relations. In fact, Iran negotiated normal diplomatic relations with Europe and the United States, and the United States pulled out of the agreement. So all who say, oh, you can't negotiate with Iran, it's typical. Uh, you know, that, that's the lie told by the powerful. The United States broke the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, negotiated solemnly by Europe and the United States and Iran, and then Trump pulled out of it. So Iran can be brought into this with the sanctions dropped against Iran and with Iran a participant in the world and uh, able to uh, uh, stop this uh, nonstop uh, U.S. attack against its diplomacy when Iran has shown it's ready to uh, engage not only the JCPOA, Iran has just joined the BRICS countries. Uh, so China, Brazil, and others can help Iran to, uh, to, to support this demilitarization 
and this demobilization. So this is the second part. We don't need a war in Gaza. We need a peace in order to stop the militarism. Of course, at the same time, Israel should not let its guard down on its border. This isn't a matter of trust. Uh, it never should have uh, incurred uh, uh, October 7 if it was doing the normal job, not the heroism, just the normal job at the border. So in the meantime, I argue that Hamas is not some fundamental existential threat to Israel today or tomorrow. It isn't. <laughs> it, it, in fact, it's trapped inside Gaza. So Israel needs to keep its border guard up but to move to politics. And then, on that basis, the UN Security Council should oversee the establishment of a sovereign Palestine that is a becomes the 194th member of the United Nations and crucially is given its capital properly in East Jerusalem and control over the Islamic holy sites, which are extremely important because the Israelis keep abusing the Islamic holy sites. So rather than stoking religious war, we should have responsibility. And this is also possible. And then my last pillar of peace is to help fund normal economy and development. But first, stop destroying Gaza because it's going to be very expensive to rebuild. And just like I said, stop destroying Ukraine and then talking about a $750 billion program to rebuild, much cheaper not to destroy it in the first place. But our dunderheads uh, in uh, our uh, foreign policy in the United States, what passes for foreign policy, don't get it uh, in any event. This is my basic point. A political solution, a demilitarization and demobilization, bringing Iran back in in normal diplomatic relations, a sovereign Palestine with its capital in East Jerusalem and control over the Islamic holy sites, and uh, a financial program to uh, put uh, the new state of Palestine on its feet. Last quick point. We're talking always, we have to talk about very dark issues. There is a lot of darkness around this a personal question uh, to wrap it up. Where is your, uh, where is the silver lining? Where do you see the beam of light in this uh, very dark world at the moment? What uh, gives you reason for uh, optimism? You know, it's a, it's a very straightforward answer, which is uh, the challenges that we face, say the war in Ukraine, which is a war caused by this stupidity of the U.S. trying to enlarge NATO to Ukraine of all places, or this war in Israel and Palestine, which is a war over uh, Israel's uh, uh, intransigence in a two-state solution and instead trying to impose an apartheid uh, system, these are easily solvable problems. This is not quantum mechanics. <laughs> this is not, uh, you know, deep cosmology. This is pretty straightforward. And so that's a great ray of hope. In fact, the other ray of hope is that the, almost the whole world says, yeah, the, of course, they get it. Uh, and so if you're not completely on some pay of uh, the military industrial complex or, you know, desperately trying to get a job in, uh, in, in uh, the Biden administration or something, it's not too hard to see what the ways out are. So the, the, the happy point is these are not unsolvable problems. This is not the character of an asteroid coming towards us and we don't know how to handle it. This is completely solvable problems. So we should be happy about that. We should be optimistic about that. We should get to work to solve them.